Okay, good afternoon. Uh, we now uh, come to the third lecture of research and publication ethics. <clears throat> so, to do a very brief uh, recap of uh, yesterday's uh, lecture, uh, where I ended with uh, uh, what could be the possible ethical principles that could govern uh, academic and research integrity. And I had talked about certain principles which could be used to uh, underline academic and research integrity. <clears throat> and these were like honesty, carefulness, openness, which I talked about. And then uh, I also talked about freedom, credit, education. Of course, in credit part, I did mention that uh, I think uh, it should be made sure that credit should be given when it is uh, when credit is due. Of course, uh, if it's not due, don't you don't have to give. But when the credit is due, it has to be given. Another point which probably I didn't mention yesterday regarding credit. See, giving uh, proper credits also helps one to fix responsibilities. Whenever uh, uh, some issue comes up regarding the publication, suppose if there is some problem with the publication, the data is flawed or some other issue is there, then of course, someone among the list of authors has to take the responsibility. So when the credit is properly uh, given, that also helps to fix the responsibility of the individual authors. So then there were other things like uh, social responsibility and legality. And in legality also, uh, scientists must be uh, aware of what are the laws which govern uh, handling of materials. And uh, so there are certain legal issues there. So when you handle hazardous materials, or uh, materials which are uh, uh, like uh, live uh, animals, etc. Then, uh, when you, when you are dealing with these kind of things, there are certain laws which are associated uh, with those uh, materials and uh, uh, and living things, for example. So, as a scientist and as a research student, one should be aware of these laws which govern the usage of hazardous materials uh, or uh, using animals for research. So what are the legal implications? Or what there are certain laws which govern usage of uh, these things. So one must be aware of these, uh, uh, these uh, laws uh, whenever uh, you have your research is associated with such materials or, or uh, such uh, animals, etc. Then, uh, of course, I have also told you about the opportunity part uh, that uh, in scientific research, everyone must be given an opportunity, equal opportunity to, to partake of the, uh, the funds which are available. And in this regard, I, I, I give an example of uh, uh, either very large, big institutes or very large scale projects which uh, corner bulk of the funding which is available and uh, and while smaller bylines or smaller universities and institutions they get uh, sort of uh, 
neglected. So these are certain things which uh, are uh, uh, possible. I mean, these issues are very much uh, possible. Then, of course, I also told you about uh, how uh, mutual respect is very important. That scientists must uh, accord mutual respect towards each other. Otherwise, if there's a breakdown of respect or trust, you cannot expect to have proper uh, scientific research uh, in the right manner. And uh, I also talked about efficiency in doing research, and uh, then of course respect for the participating subjects, especially the field of medicine. And then uh, of course I I referred you to this book, Ethics of Science, by David Resnick, and uh, it's a very nice book. I advise it. I guess it is available in PDF form also on the internet. So one should. Uh, it is really worth reading at least once. Uh, for all of you uh, who are just going into research uh, uh, right now. <clears throat> okay, so we move ahead and then uh, we go on to the, the next part of the ethical flashpoints which I had described. And uh, we have now finished the first part, the intellectual honesty and then research integrity. So today we will deal with uh, the scientific misconduct which are uh, fabrication, falsification, and plagiarism of uh, uh, data. <clears throat> so now when you talk about scientific misconduct, okay, uh, it's very easy to talk about honesty and uh, integrity, etc. But then uh, very often, I mean, you, you get or you tend to define honesty and integrity in terms of dishonesty and uh, misconduct, okay. So it is very important to know what uh, what constitutes scientific misconduct. Why should this happen? Okay, and uh, one main thing is uh, even if there is a scientific misconduct which is happening, uh, how do you how does one uh, go about quantifying this uh, scientific uh, misconduct and uh, and uh, and how do you say that something is a scientific misconduct? Okay, so this is something we, uh, we would like to know, and uh, one should also uh, try to see at what point uh, this kind of scientific misconducts actually uh, occur. <clears throat> and uh, so, in this regard, how do you define in a very broad manner what is scientific misconduct? Okay. So, in scientific misconduct, basically, oh, sorry. Basically, what it means is that there is a significant and serious deviation from the principles of honesty and uh, integrity uh, and this scholarly uh, conduct. Uh, I do this. Ah, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, deviations from principles of honesty, integrity, and scholarly conduct. So, when when does this scientific misconduct can occur? See, this misconduct can occur at any point in the entire research activity. That means right from starting of uh, formulating of a research proposal, and then the research methodology which is involved in executing this research proposal, then looking at the results, analysis of the results of the uh, research, and then finally the publication of uh, the results. And this misconduct can occur at any of these points uh, right from beginning to the end. So there is no such thing that scientific misconduct can either occur only at the beginning or at the end or in the middle. It can occur at any given point in the entire chain of uh, the research activity. <clears throat> okay, now once you have defined what is this uh, scientific misconduct, now is there any distinct line which divides uh, what is a misconduct and what is good conduct? Okay, so is there some like a distinct line between ethical and non-ethical behavior. Okay, let's see. So one can define something like a good science and a bad science. 
And if you actually really look at these two extreme ends and then see what is there in the middle, it's actually rather a very uh, hazy uh, transition. Okay, it's like a very broad, relaxed or transition where uh, you have a very uh, slow transition from one end to the other end. <clears throat> okay, so if you see on one one side, you have uh, <clears throat> what are called good research practices. That is the ideal situation where one is supposed to be very intellectually uh, honest and then uh, has person is of uh, good integrity, etc. And is expected to uh, follow good research practices. So that's a very ideal situation. Then, uh, of course, you can uh, slowly start downgrading that. And then you enter a region which is I would which is has been termed as a sloppy uh, style of working. It's a sloppy research activity. Then there are certain regions which are called the gray regions. Okay, so it starts with an unconscious bias while doing some experiments or a research work. You are not really uh, aware that uh, already the 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 route in which the particular research work is being taken is already sort of biased and you are not even aware of it. That's called unconscious bias. And then, then after that, it slowly falls into what is called a conscious bias. That means here, the person who is actually carrying out the research is aware of a certain, that he is already biased towards certain issues and certain things. And then, uh, and this area or this region is called something as a questionable research practices. Now, these questionable research practices means they are not extreme scientific misconducts. Okay. They are, of course, they can be termed as misconducts, but it is not uh, uh, that kind of a misconduct which requires extreme censure. Okay. They, they are certain uh, practices which are undesirable. Okay. So that's what uh, is meant by uh, what is called this uh, uh, questionable research uh, practices. So then when you cross this line, then the real uh, glimmer of misconduct starts appearing. Okay. So then below, uh, I mean, beyond this conscious bias, when you cross this line over here, okay, then you really go into the severe scientific misconducts, which are fabrication, falsification, and uh, uh, plagiarism. Okay, so this uh, figure, of course, I have adapted from uh, uh, Daniel Fanelli's uh, article. He has written a lot of uh, articles on uh, uh, what is good science and what is bad science, etc., and what is misconduct and things like that. So. I advise you to read these articles by Daniel uh, Fanelli. Okay, so basically, what this figure tries to convey is that between the blue and the black, there are quite a few shades of gray matter in between. <clears throat> okay, fine. So now, uh, how do we go from say uh, a, a good research practice to uh, say a very bad uh, research uh, practice? So let's see, <clears throat> how do you go from say error to fraud? So firstly, you have uh, uh, in a so-called experimental uh, mm, activity, research activity. It can be experimental, it can be anything, okay? So it's, I would, okay, say I will term it as a research activity, okay? So you first start with, let's say, an error. When you start with an error, it could mean a wrong observation, and this error could be entirely non-intentional, okay? So, uh, you, you never intended to make this error, but so happened. It was not intentional at all. But the net result of an, this error, whether it was intentional or even non-intentional, uh, non you'll, you'll have what are called wrong observations, okay? Now, <clears throat> what does a wrong observation lead to? naturally a wrong observation would lead to a wrong analysis and so this wrong analysis has originated from an error which has uh, occurred at the beginning 
uh, of the whole uh, activity which resulted in a wrong observation and then a wrong analysis and this was this error could have been non intentional also see when you land up in a wrong analysis from a non intentional error it is still uh, a, a sort of uh, it, it it can be corrected but if you land up in the wrong analysis from a wrong observation which has been through an intentionally made error then of course no one can forgive this part so it is absolutely wrong okay <clears throat> so that is the first step <clears throat> then moving on from a, a, a wrong analysis you have what are called undeclared conflicts of interest now what do you mean by say an undeclared conflict of interest here what it means is that suppose you are a research worker you are uh, you are uh, either a faculty or a, could, be, could be a student also and uh, you are working on a particular uh, research problem take some example okay maybe development of some drug uh, take some common drug uh, crocin for example uh, uh, paracetamol so you are trying to develop something like paracetamol now when you are already doing a research activity on paracetamol suppose you are also a member of a, a, a board of a company which makes paracetamol okay now here there is something which is called a conflict of interest because you are already you are associated with a company which makes the same drug on which you are actually doing a research so your research results would be of intense benefit immense benefit to that company which you are a part of already <clears throat> okay so suppose if you do not declare that uh, you are a part of that company to the rest of your research colleague or your your uh, research uh, uh, institute it is actually an undeclared conflict of interest so whenever you feel that look uh, i have uh, additional activity which could have a bearing on my present research activity you must immediately declare it in the open say that look this this is i am a part of that as well as this so people are already aware and uh, if necessary steps could be taken so that uh, uh, there is no undue advantage taken up by that other entity so this is what is called an undeclared conflict of interest so it's always good to declare a conflict of interest before going ahead with anything in case you are associated with a conflict of interest okay now next uh, misconduct comes it is called publication bias <clears throat> now what is this uh, publication bias say suppose uh, you start some research activity with some hypothesis okay now uh, say the hypothesis is some x y z and uh, your research activity you started and when the results come out the results come out as a b c and not x y z okay so it is not a b c is not satisfying your hypothesis of x y z so these results are not in a way useful to you because you have already conditioned yourself that you want x y z and hence what you try to do is you throw out this a b c so this is one kind of a uh, publication bias where you are interested only in the positive results okay that means uh, what it actually uh, translates as is that you have an inordinate focus on statistically significant data <clears throat> then another bias is that uh, you have an excessive emphasis on uh, novelty you always say that unless my results are novel i will i'll not like to publish it or this bias can exist on part of the uh, journal also the journal also can say that your results are not uh, no novel enough why should we publish it so that also is a publication bias okay then uh, then you always try to look for uh, in theoretical areas you look for new theories okay there are enough theories to work on but then you say that uh, someone is already working on a theory i don't want to work on that okay then uh, <clears throat> so then also there's a tendency to to produce 
many many redundant or trivial or incoherent uh, works so i think there was some talk about what is uh, uh, duplicate publication and redundant publications etc so this is also uh, a kind of a publication bias then we have undeserved authorship see see these are all like undeclared conflict of interest publication of bias and up to undeserved authorship these are not considered as very serious misdemeanors so they are all sort of misconducts but not too serious okay then we have undeserved authorship what do you mean by this undeserved authorship see what happens is that uh, everyone has a huge pressure to publish uh, papers and uh, so here that that's one of the reasons in fact uh, you have problems suppose you feel that uh, you want to publish uh, your results in a particular journal okay uh, it could be a very high impact journal uh, whatever it is and you are also aware that uh, in this high impact journal you have you stand a better chance of uh, publishing your results if and only if one person in the author list of your manuscript happens to be a very important person in that area of research or a well known personality in that uh, mm, in that field of research etc and uh, then what you try to do is maybe if you happen to know him or whatever whichever way you put his name in the list of authors even though he is not at all connected with your research work he has absolutely nothing to do with your research work he was not even a part of your research activity but you still give an give him an authorship okay just because you thought that uh, uh, some there is some novelty factor connected with his name and then uh, the journal might be more inclined to publish your manuscript if that particular name was there in the author list so this is what is called an undeserved authorship then uh, of course we come to the next one which is uh, now this is getting more and more serious so you come to this uh, suppressing of uh, data <clears throat> See, suppressing of data uh, is also a very serious uh, issue because what happens is that when you have a, a set of uh, uh, data or results from your ex experiments or whatever your search activity, if you happen to notice that there are certain uh, data which do not fit into your scheme of things, so you tend to throw it away. So this is what is called uh, basically suppressing of data. <clears throat> it is one one way one kind of data falsification. Okay, and uh, so you try to suppress data which is inconvenient. Okay, so you don't want that data to be seen. And uh, in fact, uh, okay, one way of uh, looking at it is that. Uh, uh, <clears throat> that uh, suppose a particular set of data is not fitting into your hypothesis like what i said earlier and uh, you you feel that in, if you throw it away then you have better chance of supporting your hypothesis okay so that is what is meant by basically suppressing of uh, data then come the big three plagiarism where you appropriate uh, the work or uh, the results of uh, another person you appropriate the ideas of another person which i mean ideas which have already been published or or they have been propounded at some uh, platform could be a conference okay so uh, when you try to copy these kind of uh, uh, earlier papers etc in toto so that is what is termed as plagiarism and this is a very severe um scientific uh, uh, misconduct and uh, the, the 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 consequences when you are caught are quite severe and then you have uh, falsification of data so falsification of data is almost similar to the suppressing of data where uh, you try to suppress unintended uh, un uh, um uh, inconvenient data which uh, do not fit into your hypothesis i uh, last lecture i told you the the example of uh, milligan uh, oil drop experiment where uh, it was known later after milligan was given the nobel prize 
It was known that uh, Millikan suppressed a lot of uh, uh, oil drop experimental data, which actually did not work out. And uh, so if that had been known earlier itself, I mean, the, the consequence could have been much different. Then finally, we have fabrication of data. This is one of the worst uh, scientific uh, misdemeanors. So where here, what happens is that you say that you, uh, you have carried out a research activity and produce some results. Whereas in actuality, what happens is you have not done even a single experiment or carried out anything at all, but simply sat on your chair and started uh, cooking up data. Okay, so that is actually data fabrication. So this is a total all all and out uh, fraud, and uh, so this is total fraud misconduct, which is highly intentional also. So this is how the whole thing uh, works from say a simple error to a total fraud and from having something non-intentional or unintentional uh, errors, et cetera, going up to totally intentional uh, uh, errors. Okay, <clears throat> so that's what I is meant by from error to fraud. So why do people indulge in scientific misconduct? So this is a million dollar question and uh, nobody can give a straight answer uh, just like that, okay. So why does this scientific misconduct happen? There are several reasons. So we'll try to list them out one by one, okay. Academic and career pressure. <clears throat> See here, uh, suppose if you are a faculty member in an institute, in an academic institute, there you will have uh, uh, you will have to carry out uh, say a teaching responsibility. You also have to carry out uh, a research responsibility. Now uh, you have to work out how to balance these two in the right way so that either of them do not suffer. The problem is both are important. You cannot give up teaching because that's the primary responsibility of the university. And you cannot give up a research activity because that's how you get your promotions or that's how you are uh, judged in your peer uh, circles, uh, how good you are, etc. So both are equally important, but then, see, you have only one day to carry out a research activity, okay? I mean, uh, in one day you have certain number of hours to carry out uh, all these things. So in that particular day you have to teach as well as you have to take care of your research activity. So one has to have a proper balance. But then very often it so happens that uh, these balances go awry. And uh, then of course you feel under severe pressure because once probably uh, you, you spend too much time in teaching, then you have very little time for research. And then when you have very little time for research, you'll have to do something or the other and then uh, bring out your uh, results. And that's where uh, the misconduct can actually creep in. Then we have uh, personal ambitions, okay? So fame, fortune, and position. See, uh, Fame, of course, everyone would like to become famous, okay? You want to be known in your peer circles that you have done some excellent research work and you are good at what you are doing. So everyone would like to, you see, everyone has some ego or the other, okay? You cannot say you have a zero ego. You have some ego, some people have more ego, some people have less ego, that's all, okay? So you, anyway, you have to, uh, you work for fame, so you try to, make your research work recognized and uh, known by others in your uh, in your line of work. So you have a personal ambition that, uh, see, unless you have an ego which can drive your research work, it will not work out, okay? So this is one uh, pressure point, okay? Then fortune, okay? You would like that uh, whatever research work you are doing would result in some nice patents or uh, intellectual properties, etc., so that you can earn money 
and uh, not only you earn money but the institution also earns money so which in 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 return they will look at you with high regard so that's one uh, personal ambition and then your position in the hierarchical structure uh, of your institution so you would like to go of course to a more senior position and uh, have more uh, research activity under yourself so this is uh, one uh, pressure point which often uh, people face next comes uh, publish uh, publish uh, publish or perish see this particular uh, uh, yeah so this publish or perish is something which uh, probably people in our country don't face so much as uh, those in the western nations where uh, most of the positions are what are called tenure track positions and uh, so these tenure track positions uh, uh, mandate that uh, unless you publish certain number of publications in a certain period of time uh, your uh, contract may not be renewed so by hook or crook you have to publish certain amount of papers otherwise you are out of the game you perish so this is again uh, a very uh, uh, i would say rather uh, uh, not a very good thing because uh, you're always after publications and uh, even if your results are not so good you somehow you like to see to it that they're published and that's where again your misconducts can creep in <clears throat> then careless methodology so you have already undergone a course on research methodology you have been informed and told how to carry out proper research uh, the methodology should be, which should be followed for proper research here again if you are careless and don't bother about proper analysis etc you can uh, also again <clears throat> end up with uh, wrong things publishing wrong things i showed you one example in the previous uh, lecture then there is pressure of uh, funding see most of the research nowadays uh, uh, you depend on grants from uh, national uh, funding agencies and uh, in fact many of our universities in the country they don't have any grants at all okay so uh, whatever grants which government gives is not really uh, much and again here there's a problem that uh, uh, well established bylines get more preference uh, in getting grants while smaller bylines do not get so many grants but uh, again uh, there is uh, uh, there is a link between the number of grants which you can uh, 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 garner in a particular period of time and the 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 uh, academic valuation which you are uh, which uh, you will have to undergo at the end of the year so the more grants you have of course it's more beneficial for the institution and they look upon you as uh, uh, a golden duck okay so that's how uh, grants matter a lot and because of this uh, you try to uh, write um, proposals for funding and uh, here again if you write something which is uh, which is untrue you may end up in uh, committing a scientific misconduct then there are cultural differences these cultural differences they come out come about because i briefly touched upon this when i talked in my first lecture about cultural relativism and things like that see when uh, a person from one nation with one cultural background goes to work in a different uh, country which has a totally different cultural uh, background uh, things can get a little difficult okay so what you consider is perfectly all right and uh, is perfectly fine and correct to do may be absolutely wrong in the other culture so if you end up going there and doing that what you have originally uh, from your original culture what is you feel is right then uh, that is not considered a proper conduct conflicts of interest i have already touched upon this there are many many uh, uh, points of uh, conflict of interest not only for the research personal but uh, even the the uh, editors of publication uh, of the journals journals themselves then the referees all are involved in what are called conflicts of interest 
and then finally of course who are mentoring and already told you about uh, how important mentoring uh, students especially is because unless the students are properly told about the pitfalls uh, in the research activities uh, you easily end up uh, committing scientific misconducts in fact it so happens that uh, very often when a scientific misconduct is noticed the first person to suffer would be the student down the line who people will point to him and say that this fellow has done it okay so who are mentoring here matters and then uh, uh, it ends up with where uh, a scientific misconduct is uh, is uh, uh, happens to occur <clears throat> okay so uh, now if you look at all these things you can see a sort of a, a, a Venn diagram kind of a thing where uh, you have all these structural factors organizational factors individual factors situational factors and cultural factors all getting uh, involved in this and that ends up in uh, uh, where you have uh, all of these contribute to a scientific misconduct uh, from uh, by uh, uh, scientific misconduct uh, which occurs <clears throat> so at the end of the day what happens again uh, finally is that uh, you have uh, the, the the big bosses who are always after uh, large funding they want more fame they want more glory and they drive the middle level scientific personnel who again finally the down the line you have the poor student who gets to stick all the uh, finally so this is how uh, unfortunately the research hierarchy works in most of the countries <clears throat> then uh, okay we come to the big three okay so fabrication so what is fabrication fabrication of uh, data what is why is it called a scientific misconduct see fabrication is one of the worst uh, misconduct which can happen so what is happening here you get to report results of experiments which have never been carried out and this data which you see is all cooked up by some means or the other so these fabricated results are not based on actual authentic data at all it's all magic okay through some magic you produce some data which uh, uh, which looks perfectly uh, authentic of course okay and uh, so this uh, is the definition of uh, fabrication of uh, data so uh, there are uh, uh, cases where people have not done even a single experiment but have shown tons and tons of uh, data coming out of their uh, experiment so of course this uh, i have shown you a, a cartoon here in reality it is very much uh, true and this is what actually uh, happens in uh, many uh, cases and uh, <clears throat> so uh, you expect like uh, some some kind of magic you get uh, suddenly a lot of data which is uh, um, uh, totally cooked up okay <clears throat> <clears throat> then we have uh, falsification of data in this case the situation is slightly different here the experiments are actually performed okay or, or the research activity is actually carried out okay and uh, but then the outcome of this research activity is manipulated by the researchers okay and this manipulation can happen at several points it can be the research material which is manipulated the equipment which can be manipulated the processes say in a chemistry you have certain processes so those processes could be uh, manipulated or you can actually modify your uh, data results okay or you try to intentionally omit certain data so that finally what happens is that what you are actually showing as your research work is not the true representation of the uh, actual research which was carried out okay for example i'll just show you uh, here a set of uh, data points here okay you have a set of data points uh, like this and then there's at least about uh, four to five data points which are rather grossly deviating from the uh, the general uh, uh, curve or the tendency of the uh, data points which is like this so you have certain data points here <clears throat> now what do you do 
okay so here there are chances of a uh, lot of things which can happen so here it is here where your ethics or ethical background etc will come into play the, a true researcher i mean uh, i would say in quotes an ethical researcher what should he do whenever he looks at these kind of data points okay you should first worry about it and uh, say that look there are certain data points which are bucking the trend the trend is going on like this why is it that there are some data points which are falling out like this see if you have some thousand data points which are in this batch uh, line of data points and you have just one or two data points outside still you can say that okay there is a very distinct possibility of some instrumental error okay or some other thing which has happened at that point uh, of measurement which made uh, one single data point fall away from the rest of the data points what is the ideal thing to do in this case the ideal thing to do in this case would be that you go back to the uh, experiment again redo the experiment check whether these data points are getting repeated or is some random fluctuation in these data points and and then take a decision on this but at the beginning itself if you take a very convenient uh, line that uh, look these set of data points are not convenient for me and then hence i would like to remove them and then i have a nice curve which is like this which is a totally wrong thing to do because there are several things which you could have happened suppose those data sets those data points have been genuine so that you would have missed out on some extremely novel thing which would have happened in, in your experiment it could have fetched you even a nobel prize for example no one know i mean god only knows in fact this this is what happened in the case of uh, high tc superconductivity when it was first observed this was something which has happened okay we'll get back to that a little later so if you just simply uh, uh, move away those data points and then uh, fit the curve this is not correct so this is just uh, absolutely uh, blunt falsification of data which is totally wrong <clears throat> okay <clears throat> so one should not do this then of course comes uh, plagiarism which i had told you that it is appropriation of another person's ideas processes results or words without giving appropriate credit where it is due so basically it is presentation of someone else's research plan someone else's manuscript or someone else's article or text or parts of text as one's own uh, uh, experiment or one's own research activity so this is also a very extreme form of scientific misconduct and uh, and which is uh, really really uh, uh, bad i would say okay and uh, then you can ask a question i mean if there are such serious misconducts do they keep occurring often okay unfortunately they do of course so these fabrication falsification and plagiarism they totally violate publication ethics and research ethics of course and one thing which is very very specific here is that each of these misconducts has a perpetrator or an offender who is very clearly identifiable but the last one plagiarism it also has an additional thing that means it has a very clearly identifiable victim also okay the plagiarism always has a very clearly identifiable victim also in a, in addition to the fellow, a person who has actually carried out the plagiarism okay <clears throat> so if you ask the question does this happen often unfortunately yes it does happen very often it could be happening in your own lab it could be happen in your lab next to you or it can happen anywhere and it happens quite often so this is one of the very reasons that uh, uh, the university grants commission wanted uh, all the young uh, research students who are into their career to know about these problems and how they occur why they occur so that you also don't make the same uh, mistakes and uh, so if you are 
if you are really well aware of about these things it is hoped that uh, you you do not uh, do the unfortunate uh, uh, thing like uh, carrying out this kind of scientific misconducts so now i'll just go through quickly some case histories some very strange uh, case histories which happened in the history and uh, and how severe they were you will be really <clears throat> stunned to see these uh, kinds of uh, cases uh, this is one case of uh, a student by name uh, bingud sejan uh, who was at columbia university in the us she was a phd student and uh, <clears throat> the investigations when uh, they they tried to someone pointed out there something strange they showed a massive and sustained effort by this lady over the course of more than a decade to dope experiments manipulate and falsify nuclear magnetic resonance experiments and uh, elemental analysis research data and even create fictitious people and organizations to vouch for the reproducibility of the results and the committee which was formed to examine uh, this student it it was uh, found that uh, this person was found guilty of 21 counts of research misconduct by the ORI ORI is the office of uh, research integrity in the united states uh, see this person joined the university around 2000 or something like that and it took almost 10 years to find out that this person has carried out all this scientific misdemeanors and uh, this ORI states that season has falsified fabricated and plagiarized research data so she did all the three in three papers and also in her doctoral thesis and then some six papers that she had co-authored with her professor uh, uh, dalibor sames they have been withdrawn because these results could not be replicated <clears throat> so uh, <clears throat> this case actually began in 2000 and in within two years there was a concern raised by the reproducibility of uh, her research and uh, see this is uh, one thing which i told you about that whenever you do some research uh, work there are already others around you who will be looking at your research work and if you happen to be doing something novel people would naturally like to find out what you're doing and also try to do it themselves because a novelty can spread so they were members of a research lab who were trying to do the same research but they found that they were unable to reproduce those day, those results Okay. And then by the time in 2005, she already received her PhD degree and then her uh, activity became known. That was at the peak at that time. <clears throat> and the reports detail how she logged into the NMR spectroscopy equipment under the name of at least some other uh, one other member and then merge her data and the other data and use certain uh, I mean, all kinds of uh, things to create data okay uh, to suit her hypothesis okay so that's how she could uh, do this and uh, <clears throat> the, the problem was why did this occur see what has happened is again when i talked about why do scientific misconducts occur there was peer pressure there was publishing pressure and things like that now the 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 supervisor here in this case he felt that this person was producing a lot of data which is publishable he never bothered to find out whether that person was actually giving proper data or not and he was able to publish that data and he was very happy with her so he was refusing to listen to others who pointed out that look there is certain there are certain issues with this data there are certain problems with this data but then they, he just never bothered to find out about that okay so this is how problems go on uh, multiplying then what happened once this lady found out that uh, her game was up she simply vanished from that place her degree was also withdrawn uh, from uh, columbia university but then she was brazen enough to go to another place in another uh, continent she went to heidelberg university got a phd in uh, molecular biology and everything was fine but then so but then whatever she did in the columbia university was uh, was total fraud but then what the result of it where is she now she is now at uh, some place in her own country and she is quite happy 
Okay, then we go on to another person, uh, Ronald Plasterk. He was a Dutch scientist. Not only he was a scientist, but he was also a politician. He was a minister in the government. So even more dangerous. So there was a, a paper in the journal Science. Science is a very reputed journal. It's very difficult to publish uh, papers in science. And uh, this person published a paper in science. And it was found after five years after, after the paper was published, a person by name Elizabeth Bick, <clears throat> she found out that uh, there are certain issues with the with the data which appeared in the paper and then raised a red flag on this now there was a problem you see science is such a reputed journal when you point out that uh, a paper that has been published in science is wrong or it has it is uh, it is having some misconduct first thing which the journal would try to do is suppress it Okay, it, it will refuse to accept that uh, 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 that such a thing could have happened with with that journal. So they don't like that uh, a reputed journal has uh, accepted a, a very fabricated data or something like that. So first thing which uh, this uh, uh, the journal people did was they did not entertain the the red flags which were raised, but then it took a lot of effort. And another problem of this guy was a politician also. It took a lot of uh, uh, effort on part of uh, uh, this person, Elizabeth Bick. And uh, you can actually watch, uh, read this uh, journal called Retraction Watch, where it, this gives several instances of papers which have been withdrawn after they are published when it became known that uh, uh, the, the, the particular papers were plagiarized or data has been fabricated or falsified. Okay. so. So in uh, in 2015, she actually posted uh, her concerns about this paper, and finally, of course, uh, the journal uh, actually uh, okay. This is an example of how uh, the the data was simply uh, sorry duplicated. You can see that the data here, these two and this, they are all the same. Okay, and these two are the same, and these two are the same data. Okay, whereas in the paper, it was actually shown that they are all unique and individual data okay so uh, so she showed very clearly that uh, look this is how it has been done so then the the journal asked for the original data from the the authors but then the authors very conveniently refused to give the original data giving some uh, uh, explanation that uh, uh, they have lost the original data and all the people who were connected with that uh, experiment that left that institute and the data could not be located that finally there was nothing else which the journal could do and they had to uh, force the authors to retract the paper so that was a saving grace for the journal because the journal did not have to remove the paper but the authors themselves actually uh, retracted the paper then we have a case of uh, Saizo Miyata. He was uh, a very big professor in Tokyo Institute of Technology, again, a very important uh, institute. And he was working on uh, carbon alloy, alloy uh, catalyst. Then uh, here it was a strange case where the, the leader of the group himself found out that there's a problem with uh, the data which was being published by his own lab uh, group members so then he found that uh, one of his postdocs has actually fabricated uh, data and uh, he confronted that postdoc and asked him what he has done and the postdoc actually confessed that yes he had actually fabricated the data now the papers had already uh, uh, appeared in the journal and uh, uh, now they, they made a retraction where they have stated that, that the manuscript contains fictitious data and the scientific community takes a very strong view on this matter and apologies are offered to the readers of the journal that it was not detected during the submission process. But then how could this happen for such a big professor over there sitting there? The problem is, if you see the, the statement which was put out by the professor, he said that, I didn't know exactly what they were doing in the lab, how they were producing data. 
I visit only once a week to meet with the scientists. Even though I didn't know how exactly what happened, I was head of that project and that is why I have to take responsibility to resign. And uh, so basically what was happening is this guy Miyata was having some people under him and those people had some more people under them. So it was like a highly hierarchical structure where the guy at the top sits somewhere else and then tries to conduct the research. But then here, this was a case where the, the, the leader himself took lead in taking the responsibility and came out with it. Okay, but very few people do that. Then finally, we have another uh, very famous case called the Baltimore Affair. And uh, this was uh, in, involving a Nobel Prize uh, winning scientist called David Baltimore. And uh, then here in one of his papers, uh, uh, it was suspected that it contained some fraudulent data. Now, this appeared sometime in uh, 1986 in the journal Cell. And there were six authors. And this person, David Baltimore, is supposed to have supervised the research. But of course, he did not do the experiments which are done by the, the students. <clears throat> okay. So then what, what was the claim in this paper? They claimed that experiments showed that the insertion of a foreign gene into a mouse can induce the mouse genes to produce antibodies mimicking those of the foreign genes. And if this claim were true, it would suggest that one could control the immune system by using foreign genes to make it produce antibodies. So it's an excellent hypothesis. But so far, this particular research could not be confirmed by any other scientists. Okay? And this was, uh, these experiments were supposed to have conducted uh, one Whitehead Institute and the Tufts University. And they were founded, uh, funded by the National Institute of Health in the United States. Then one of the uh, postdoc who was working at one of the institutes connected with this research, Margot O'Toole, and uh, <clears throat> she was under the supervision of one of the paper's authors who was, whose name was Imani Shikari. So this person, O'Toole, she grew quite suspicious about this research when she found that almost some 17 pages of this uh, Imanishi Kari's notes that contradicted the findings of the paper. And she failed in an attempt to repeat those experiments which were conducted by Imanishi Kari. Okay. So then this person, Marco O'Toole, she blew the whistle and then they, she informed the review boards at the university about her suspicions and then an investigation started. And the initial investigations found some errors, but they did not conclude that the research was questionable. You see, this person was a Nobel Prize winner. So when you try to question a Nobel Prize winner's work, you have to be careful. So people generally wouldn't like to do that. So unfortunately, you see, the consequence of this was the, the person who, uh, who was the whistleblower, she was simply uh, thrown out of the group. And uh, it became, of course, very difficult for her to get any subsequent uh, positions elsewhere also. And, uh, but later the, 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 the ORI office followed up these investigations and then there was a big scandal and uh, a very big investigation was there. But ultimately whatever happened was that uh, the whole thing was simply buried and, uh, and this person was just simply asked to take uh, leave from the institute. So uh, these are the things which can actually uh, happen uh, whenever you have this kind of uh, uh, fabrication of data or falsification of data. So data falsification would actually what it involves. As I said, you remove an outlier from a series of measurements. So you have a set of data which is falling out of the general trend, you throw it out. Okay. Then you, 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 you have uh, like you have this uh, something which uh, uh, observation which is not what you want, you so throw it in the dustbin. Then you change a measurement to ma make it look better, okay? Or when you uh, talk about this uh, cell uh, uh, research, uh, you, you have what are called Western blots, which are certain terminology used for uh, identifying those genetic markers. So uh, they are either simply rotated or mirrored or stretched or something like that to show that there's a different uh, experiment. Then you can also have uh, misrepresenting of results from statistical analysis, or you can also show two overlapping microscopy images to represent two different kinds of experiments. 
so you can here you can see that there was supposed to be a published data where each of these uh, uh, figures are supposed to have a different uh, experimental condition but in reality if you see parts of the figures if you see they are all same and repeated so these two are repeated this section and this section is repeated here this section and this section absolutely in total repeated and these two is the lower part here and the upper part here is repeated so this is simply doctoring of data to make it look as if that uh, you have a lot of data and uh, things like that okay so you duplicate some cells on a photo to make it look as if some treatment resulted in a higher cell density and all these kind of things so these are all the tricks people uh, undertake to show that uh, they have uh, uh, done some extra generated some extra data finally we have uh, falsification case histories i take a one case which is of uh, anil putti he was an indian student at uh, the university school of medicine duke university the uh, or i found that uh, this person engaged in uh, misconduct by including totally false research data in some papers which was submitted for a manuscript it was submitted for a funding application also and uh, it was found that uh, he uh, it seems he wrote that six out of some 33 patients responded positively to some drug when only four patients were actually enrolled in the project and no none of those four persons also responded to the project and then and he got four ct scans which are presented and nobody knows where he got those four ct scans from and this person he altered data sets to improve the accuracy of the predictors for response to treatments and he submitted this as a paper <coughs> and uh, then uh, he did some uh, these are all markers which people in cancer research will be more interested in and so ultimately that he he said that look i have done work on so many subjects or so many data points when there were none at all okay and uh, so this was totally uh, false data and finally they had to be retracted and uh, he was uh, asked to go and uh, i think this probably this is the last one this is the case of uh, Hendrik Schoen from Bell Labs. Hendrik Schoen was uh, considered a golden uh, guy in the Bell Labs when he joined because the way he was producing papers, one paper every week in one of the best journals. And so no, no one dared to even question him that uh, what, where he is getting the data from. He showed a reckless disregard for the day, sanctity of data. And then uh, he was... He was uh, known for creating field effect transistors uh, out of tiny molecules, but nobody was able to reproduce his results. And then finally, when uh, people started uh, looking closely into the results, they found that this guy has actually uh, simply duplicated data and uh, totally doctored uh, data to suit uh, his hypothesis. So that's how things work. And uh, so finally, I talk about plagiarism, but now I run out of time. So again, plagiarism is the appropriation of another person's ideas, processes, results, or words without giving appropriate credit. And again, in plagiarism, besides there being a perpetrator of plagiarism, there is a very clearly identifiable victim whose credit has been stolen by the perpetrator. So I'll be uh, dealing with this in the next lecture. So because plagiarism is a very, very important uh, uh, scientific misconduct, which everyone should know about and should be made aware so that for heaven's sake, you people should not be uh, uh, indulging in this uh, uh, plagiarism. So I would like to probably stop here. And uh, any questions, please, if I don't know if anyone of you would like to ask any questions here. You can unmute yourself and. Uh, 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 this is Satya, sir. Yes. Hello. Uh, yeah. Yes. I, so essentially, selective representation of data is a kind of uh, data falsification, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. OK. So another thing is. Uh, Many, uh, although we have not discussed, and I believe I think we'll be discussing it in the next class. So this yeah. is the issue of self-plagiarism or uh, ah, taking an, 
and the case of taking images from you know different papers which yes, is the yes, most yes. i think rampant in uh, the yes, yes. so I'll, so I'll, i'll be dealing with yes. this yes okay that's correct okay so in the next class then yes yes okay any other questions please yeah any other question you can also write in the chat box if you want i don't know okay if there are no more questions thanks for your patience so we'll meet on uh, monday thank you thank you sir